Hi guys and welcome back to Switch Up. Thanks to the developers for the review copy. There's a reason that Pillars of Eternity quickly blasted past its initial Kickstarter goals to gain the largest ever game backing at the time with over $4 million raised. People just wanted more. Each stretch goal offered more of what would hopefully be a return of the Infinity Engine style Borders Gate experiences of old. Now why go with Kickstarter? Well, it gives them the freedom, something that most publishers just won't be able to give as much as needed when you're essentially trying to bring back a golden era game. Too much risk. Let me tell you right off the bat, the risk more than paid off. Why? Let's find out. You'll have played a hundred games that claim to be filled with lore. Skyrim's bookshelves lined with tales, wastelands, wastes filled with unique and interesting characters, and of course, Baldur's Gate placing you as an apprentice in a world jam-packed with untold tales and more dialogue than most of us had ever seen before. The special aspect of story is how your character and choices can actually change things. The core story sees you journeying as part of a large caravan. Given a choice of personal motivations, in an early dialogue choice, you'll quickly learn more of your own gifting for watching the spirits of others, seeing into their pasts and communicating with them. I won't talk about where this leads you, but I will say that as a narrative device, seeing a character and being able to look perhaps into their past, which shifts and warps the screen accordingly, is a hugely clever way of intertwining some otherwise very difficult narrative lines together. Take an early traveler I bumped into. After a brief dialogue where he frantically told me of his despair, after a friend and he were ambushed by a bear, leaving his friend dead, he told me of how devastated he was and off he went to return home. Now, as you would expect, I couldn't just sit back and leave this unsolved. I set off north to find the cave. If one thing sticks in your mind about the type of game we're dealing with, then this little nugget is important. Obsidian don't waste dialogue. If someone says something, expect to be able to investigate it to some degree. And so there I was heading for what could be certain death. Oh, how I've missed this. The nearest on Switch is probably Skyrim. Upon arriving at the cave, you'll invariably have to deal with the bear and, if you survive, are visited by the soul of the dead friend. Now, I won't spoil what happens, but I can tell you that from this point, there are at least three different endings to just this one tiny little tale. The detail is so satisfying for the player. Add in that several of the dialogue choices will even rely on some of the decisions you've made when creating your character, including your intelligence and the possibilities for a truly role-played experience are evident. When you load up the game, it makes no bones about the difficulty it's going to present, with several different choices on offer. Character design can be a touch daunting. With six races and 11 classes to choose from, this in itself took me around about half an hour just because of the sheer number of customizations. In the end, my daughter just demanded I create her, so Bella the Mage with a penchant for crossbows and a tough as nails character was born. But you really can design your perfect one with some arguably limited visual choices such as color, but after a good 30 hours of finding new gear, they'll look more than unique enough. The experience takes place from a top-down perspective where you can either directly control your character with the left stick or use the right with the cursor more like a mouse. Zooming in and out is easy with the D-pad and selecting individual well, party right. members or grouping has also been streamlined. The importance of a solid control scheme can't be underestimated, and they have nailed it here. The radial menus accessible with the left and right triggers make quickly choosing any element you usually would with a keyboard and mouse quick and painless. Combat takes place in a semi-real-time fashion, with the ability to pause time whenever you choose to allow tactical decisions to be made. Now make no mistake, it is a tactical game. It even allows for formation changes to suit a particular strategy. Playing as a squishy mage, meant sending forward my tanks first. You can tweak the CPU AI so that they react in a number of different ways, and this allows you to automate if you so choose. If you don't fancy any of this, then don't worry. You can simply hold an A button, which brings up a line of sight targeting cone to essentially point and shoot with your entire party. Enemy health is shown here, and it's important that you think carefully before attacking one. For instance, I like to enter stealth mode, which then takes advantage of some points I've spent in the stealth attack skill, giving extra damage upon first shot. Oh. While at other times, I like to use both mages for huge area of effect attacks from range before attacking once they dissipate. Friendly fire is very much a consideration to this combat. Your health is also an interesting area. It's divided into two pools, endurance and your main health. You'll notice the latter is a larger one 
but this doesn't replenish without some intervention, such as camping or potions after a battle. Endurance, on the other hand, is smaller, and if reduced to zero in combat, will knock out that character. On some difficulty modes, a character whose health is fully depleted can be permanently killed which is both wonderful and terrifying in equal measure. Other than yourself, you'll be introduced to a number of unique potential traveling companions, naturally as you progress throughout the game. If you're not the social type, then you could go it alone to a degree, but you'll find it very tough. In terms of NPC design, these are possibly some of my favorites, since Minsk and Boo joined my necromancer child of ball all those years ago. Voice acting is much more prominently used throughout the game, although there's a lot of text to read, but the key characters are excellently voiced and unlike say maybe Skyrim where you can literally hear the same voice maybe 20 times on 20 different characters Adventurer like you then I took an arrow in the knee no hate that's one of my favorite games of all time here you'll feel like most not all of the characters are exactly that unique Throughout your adventures, you'll be finding plenty of loot, and your choices that you've made in terms of the character design will increase the usability of these, with the usual array of quest-rewarded goodies and random discovery dotted about the place. While incredibly tightly designed, the experience also feels emergent, an important factor for a rewarding experience. The little tale of the bear at the start is literally the tip of the iceberg for side questing and off-the-beaten-path adventuring. Of the many towns and cities you'll visit, each acts as a hub for tons of side content. You can easily bring up the map using the radial menu and check on your journal for where to head next. As with any good RPG, there are times where you'll have to use your brain. Some puzzles will require you to read books within the world or pay close attention to dialogue responses for the hidden meaning. The final element is character leveling. A traditional leveling system means that every action you undertake, from picking locks to using magics and completing quests, will gain you experience points. This can then be used to gradually improve your party. About 30, 35 hours into the game and my character was looking nothing like she started and the way that I play has changed dramatically. I could go on and on about crafting, weapon upgrading or countless other systems that you can get involved with if you so choose but I think I've hopefully covered the most important things. Gameplay is absolutely excellent, but maybe more slow and calculated than some are used to. I think it's absolutely great and goes to show that remaking everything in the name of streamlining isn't always necessary. But it's also important to realize that while there are some great tweaks to the formula, this is still essentially a 20 year old game design and some people may not enjoy that. But for me, while I don't think that should put anyone off, it's worth knowing. Gameplay scores 19 out of 20, but controls while excellent just can't be as good as they would be with a keyboard and mouse. They score 18 out of 20. Visually, the world of Pillars of Eternity looks great. While customization in the form of numerous items of gear is possible, and the token color choice of clothing is there, it's the beautiful crafting of the environment that are the standout elements. While some have simply said it looks dated, I'd argue these are some brilliantly painted and designed locales that feel like they could exist. Lighting's decent and beyond the capabilities of those older games. The only real negative I could level at the game is that when there are several characters on the screen and a ton of enemies, it can become a little bit overcrowded. The character portraits are just as good as their inspirations and can add a good deal to the overall feeling of quality. Performance in docked and handheld is absolutely on point, but the game does feature quite a few loading screens just by its very nature. This isn't an open world game and consists of transitions between areas. They aren't terribly long but are frequent enough to be noteworthy. In handheld, the game is easy enough to control and you'll be navigating it without issue in this mode. It's just a shame they didn't include touchscreen options. Audio's absolutely sublime. while interestingly relying on shorter audio cues. This can be dangerous, as there's nothing worse than a clearly looping piece of music. Here they are subtly and carefully designed. It allows the audio to shift quickly between areas see if they left anything useful behind. and create entirely different moods with new instruments being introduced. While not completely recorded by a full orchestra, there is a large chunk here that is. Ambient sounds are also decent and combat ones solid enough. With each spell convincingly otherworldly. The only negative I could level at the game is easily fixed. The music's just too loud by default, drowning out everything. I turned it down. <clears throat> that's it. That's all I've got. You gotta help me out. 
Visual score 18 out of 20. They look great, but it can get a little hectic. Audio is brilliant. It scores 19 out of 20 and could only have been improved by an entirely orchestrated score, but I'm really reaching there. The game costs £35.99, $39.99 or €39.99 at launch and I believe that represents a 20% discount which goes on for a few weeks yet, so now's probably the time if you're interested. It's coming in at a hefty price, yes, albeit even with the initial discounted rate. Having said that, this really is the ultimate version for my money. Having a game like this in a mobile form just works so perfectly. It's been a revelation playing this while on holiday. It really hits home what makes the Nintendo Switch so special. Now, that being said, it's running a touch over the Steam price, and when fully priced, it's going to be around about 25% more expensive. Are you willing to pay the extra well that's kind of up to you what i can say though is this is a title well worth the money with the addition of the white march expansions part one and two as well as the huge original game you're looking at around about 60 to 100 hours to beat and when you factor in multiple playthroughs and those of us who like to take things a little more slowly you could easily double that figure. With the upcoming release of Pillars 2 on Switch, for a new player such as myself, this has been an absolute must-buy type experience. If you're a double dipper, maybe wait for a sale, but I think we can all agree the game has buckets of value regardless. Value scores 17 out of 20. Glenn and I will both tell you, sometimes reviewing games is rubbish. You never get enough time with the games that you want to play and have to spend too much with those you don't. Pillars of Eternity is the exact opposite of that oh so common occurrence. Not only have I loved the time I've spent with the game, but it's got me incredibly excited for the sequel on Switch. It scores a Switch Up score of 91%, an absolutely great RPG not to be missed by any fans of the genre new and old. Thanks to all the patrons and everyone who comments down below. We really appreciate it and to those chaps who uh, said hello at the start of the video hi hi there you go for all things switch all the time keep it switch up cheers guys see ya